Hello, folks. Adam Bazaljet here from the uh, Lagshot headquarters in Naples, Florida. Should I say anything? No viewers yet. Okay. Orientation is locked. Rotate the bike back. Because it's locked. Hey folks, we're just trying to sort out a couple of technical problems. We're here at the Lagshot headquarters in Naples. Appreciate you joining. Yes, and a couple of people coming in. Hey folks. These shows give me an opportunity to hit some range balls, so that is that is always fun. Just waiting for a few folks to join. If, you, if you're hearing the sound okay and seeing the volume okay, we'd appreciate some sort of a comment. Well, what would be a good number if they put a seven in the box if the sound's good? Kevin's going to be checking those. Anyone put a put anything in a notification box in a comment box? Maybe a seven if the sounds good. Five people, Five people in there. Okay, so far we're just starting to get people in. We're having a few technical problems. The I don't know all the where's and why for's, folks. But we appreciate you joining. Uh, happy to take your questions and comments. Just wait for a few more to come in. But you're welcome to start typing in some questions. Would love to know if you think sound is good. Picture is, I assume, pretty good. I don't see why it wouldn't be. Nine people in now. Um, Is there any way we can figure out how they're, they're getting in so we can get more people in? Yeah, they have to go back to the SGA page and see that you're going live as a subscriber. That's how they're going to find you, correct? Eric, we're just, going to we're just trying to solve a couple of problems, guys, and we'll have some fun here. I appreciate you joining in. Okay. So what, do we have any questions there, Kevin? No questions yet. We have a winter theme. Tell them about the winter. Yeah, we have a little winter theme here. We just want to talk about, uh, first off, we invited, and we have, say, a few couple of problems here. We invited people of all member categories in for this Christmas special. We hope to get to meet people, let them see what happens here at Scratch Golf Academy. 
Uh, and generally in the winter, in the off season, many of the folks are not able to really get outside and play or practice much for weather reasons, obviously. So uh, just thought I'd talk at times on the questions about stuff you can practice away from the golf course or practice indoors. I would say this, that in my experience, particularly when I work for David Ledbetter around those pros a lot, they all get the club in their hand fairly regularly, could be just for two, three minutes away from the golf course. And it gives them an opportunity to really create some feedback to kind of make the movements more fluid and more smooth and get used to a couple of the things they're trying to feel so that when they get to the golf course, they're much more familiar with what they're trying to do. I cannot emphasize how valuable that is. It isn't hours, it's minutes regularly. The people that, this is one of my little themes I know, people that only have a golf club when there's a ball underneath them at full speed trying to hit a good shot, generally, uh, it's a little tougher for those folks, doesn't work so well. So do we have, if we have any questions, feel free to pop one in there. I've got a question. In, in the winter for our northern friends, how are we staying ready for season? What's, what's the best practices? Daily? So winter practices, we just touched on a minute ago. I think certainly getting the club in your hand, whatever it is that you're working on, a mirror is great, a sliding glass door, something like that, even without it, working on your posture, being comfortable at a dress, whatever the key positions are for you. For me, for instance, I tend to get too far behind the ball and find myself too tilted. So for me to just rehearse feeling more stacked on top of the ball where I can get the downswing more underneath me is very valuable. The other thing, of course, depending on who you are, is some fitness and stretching. Now at Scratch Golf Academy for the full, at the, at the full membership site, we have an entire off-season course. There's five different courses. And three of them, as I recall, uh, one of them was on working away from the golf course, but three of them, I believe, were working with a great workout guy that teaches some tremendous young players called Anthony Vesecchia. He takes you through physical exercises, drills you can do indoors to create feel, but for strength and flexibility, so that when you get to the, it's a great time to build that up, so that when you get to the season starts to come around, you're not only used to your swing, but you're actually in better shape and more flexible, et cetera, than you were going into the off season. So we're not, again, we're not talking 12 hours a week. We're talking carefully allocated five, six, seven minute blocks, depending on how, you know, how engaged you are with your game, at what your goals are. So, as I say, for me, if I go for this angle, my, the things I would work on in my case are getting my arms a little more across me while staying over the ball. My tendencies have always been to get a little farther from the ball, get my arms up in front of me a little bit. So from this angle, staying more on top of it, and from this angle, getting my arms more across me so I stay over it. They're just things I stay with. Once you've played for several years, eh, maybe a, an underestimation, once you've played a number of years and you've worked on your game, most probably you've got a number of things that you consistently do well, but when you break down, the faults will tend to be in specific areas that are specific for you, just as I've outlined some of mine. So once you've been around the block a lot of times, you need to get a little video feedback, a coach you trust or whatever, but keep at those same port parts of your golf swing, and uh, I think you'll do better with it for sure. Nick Price, let's go back to the Leadbetter days. Nick used to, great player, obviously. He used to get the club shut a little bit, a little too vertical, and then he would almost over flatten it. So he worked consistently on getting the club more open and more behind him and feeling more on top of the shot, less underneath it. That was sort of the stuff he worked on. But that was uh, what he went. We're going to get your questions going here in just a moment and get to them. Um, a great time of year to be down in South Florida. I'm telling you, the first two, three weeks of December, wouldn't you agree, Kevin, are amongst the, the absolute most reliable weather weather weeks you can have down here. It never gets really cold. It doesn't get exceptionally hot. The hurricanes, thank God, are behind us, at least for seven, eight, ten months, and we are having beautiful weather. So it's at nighttime, of course, here, so it's dark outside, but great time to be playing golf down here. Plus, the thick of our winter season hasn't really kicked in yet, so golf courses are between Thanksgiving and Christmas aren't slow, but it's a lot softer, great weather. It's a great time to be down here if you can make it down. What happens for most people, if they're going to take a holiday in Florida, if they're not seasonal residents or they have uh, relatives down here or something, they're probably going to take it closer to Easter, closer to their golf season, kids out of school. That's why this time of year, if anything, people are going north for the holidays, for Christmas, etc. They're not coming south. So it's a great time to come visit. You just, 
if you're a golfer, you'd have a period of time after your holiday here before you can actually get out and, uh, and work on your game up north in the weather. Any questions rolling in so far? So the live chat is enabled now. Okay. People coming in, we've, I think we've sorted out a couple of technical issues there. So come on in, feel free to type your questions in there. I'll do the very best I can. A little Christmas special here. We invited everyone that's on the Scratch Golf Academy list, whether paid or not members for this show here, just to kind of a Christmas deal, try to get some people involved and get them enjoying the, hopefully enjoying the show if I do a halfway decent job. Okay. Okay, so, as, yeah, not much sense about that. Can you, is there any way to send out a note? If they refresh their page, they'll be able to ask questions. Okay, so if you refresh your page now, you can ask questions. We should be in good shape. So pop a couple of questions in. I'll be glad to get to it. Uh, here at the Lagshot Worldwide Headquarters in Naples, Florida, beautiful facility, as you see. We've got a launch monitor. We've got a nice place to hit balls. And a lot of stuff goes on here, the testing of the lag shots, the development of new products, at least, you know, in theory, then, then they're made elsewhere, but uh, a lot of stuff going on. Of the new, just generally the new drivers? Yeah, you know, the question is, with a lot of new drivers coming out, right, any I'd recommend, and I'm going to give you a really dull answer here, but I think the best one, and that is, there's not really one that's just better than the other. They all have slightly different performance tendencies and characteristics. So if you're going to invest four or $500 in a driver, I am telling you, find a quality club hitter with it, with a launch monitor, force, foresight, or a track man, or a, uh, the, the one I use there at the academy, the, the flight scope, and get a fitting for that one club. Don't invest all that money without it. They're so good at it now, they'll see your launch characteristics and fit the kind of driver and flexibility of the shaft, et cetera, et cetera, to get you your best results. So if you're gonna invest, get a club fitting. You can do it for just a driver, it would be great. Any questions popping? Yes, a couple. I want four and okay. Kevin? Kenneth. Kenneth Spann. Kenneth Spann. How do you get your club in the slot? Well, the slot, what you'd be talking about, is the slot coming down. Always bear this in mind. The angle of the club shaft is what dictates this. That's the club design. Now, you're not going to, in all likelihood, swing it entirely along that. So later in your backswing, your arms rise a little bit. Depends on the player. So remember this. Your first move down, hey, certainly is some body motion, but it's getting the arms down more where you get back to that plane before you come and hit it. Most people get up to the top and they attack the golf ball too much so they're above the slot. So remember, we're not trying to drop our right side, but we're trying to get to some downward motion to get to that plane before you really feel like you hit it. Perfect. Michael asks, for any exercise to hone contact point over the winter? Any exercise, Michael asks, any exercise to hone contact point over the winter? I think there's a couple of things you check into. Number one, is your swing complex? For example, if your club's coming down steeply, you're going to have to react to that. You're either going to have to straighten up or pull your arms up or do something, Michael. And the more stuff you're having to do and adjust and fool around with, the less likelihood you are of making solid contact. If, however, you feel like you're in the slot, as we just got a question, you feel like you have a nice run up to the golf ball with a bit of weight shift, I think hitting a lot of little shots, this is an eight on, where you can really map in the feeling of tilting the face against the ball, compressing the ball, and to really find the feeling of compressing it on that sort of a scale will help you dial it in. So first thing is the motion good, second thing dial it in with some little low punch shots. Todd asked, uh, Todd said, good evening hey. New York. Hey Todd, upstate New York, how are you? Well, I think it's the same indoor or outdoor. Yeah. It taught us from upstate New York an indoor drill to, to get rid of early extension. Early extension, this is flexion, this is extension. So the angle you set at a dress and throughout your backswing, if that straightens up before you hit the ball, that's extending too early. Now, it's important to point out, when you look at the side of a golfer, they're bent forward at a dress. But when you look at the side of them in the finish, if they're a good player, they're no longer bent forward. They have extended. That means their hips have come underneath them. You want to finish like that. Early extension is when you do it prematurely. So 
I think you'd first look at, is there a cause for it? Usually, and I'm on this thing tonight, usually too much steepness causes a player to have to bail back and out. Think of getting a pitch inside in baseball, you'd have to back up to hit it. If you don't feel like you have a cause for it, club's in a decent slot, then you just have to work on really keeping your, keeping your body angles, but staying in balance and staying in motion. When I see people work on staying over the ball, they get frozen, they get stuck, they stop turning. So practice, say, if I had a rag in my hands, I had to brush off a low bench or something. Stay in movement, stay in balance, but keep your chest reasonably near the ground. And as I say, don't just stay over the ball, stay in motion a little bit. One other little drill, by the way, if you take a club and choke down on it to like that far, set up normally, then choke down. Now the club is six, seven inches off the ground. Hit a little shot and go down and find the ball a little bit. Just on that scale, it's kind of a fun drill to feel like you're actually compressing through the ball. Somebody wants to go through your pre-shot routine. Pre-shot routine. Any, any name on that? Can't tough to pronounce. That's okay. We're, we're still, my name's tough to pronounce, Basiljet. You know, pre-shot routines, I think, develop over time. And a lot of top-notch players, you remember Mike Weir, the lefty one at Augusta? He had this thing he did like that before every shot. His friend through all those years, his coach, excuse me, he was a good friend of mine, and the coach said, I never tried to get Mike to do that. Mike was working on his takeaway so often he got so used to rehearsing it, he just had to do it before he hit. So I think your idea of a pre-shot routine, certainly generally get the club face lined up first, then stand in relation to the club. Practice it so that when you put the club on the ground, you create good body angles. But beyond that, and that would be worth practicing in front of a mirror, it's just what do you feel comfortable with? I like to stay over the ball a bit longer and fidget a little bit. That just suits me. I'd rather be the Bobby Jones model that just kind of got set up and went, but uh, it's one of several things that I don't have in common with Bobby Jones, unfortunately. But uh, build your own routine if you're getting good posture. Anthony Viola asked, I had a, please review how we can get a divot with an iron. Anthony, about a divot with an iron. This is an easy one in theory. If your golf club, say my hand is the ground, will reach low point when it gets to vertical, it's possible to manipulate that out with some strange body motion. That's pretty true though. So if at impact, you're hitting it with the handle forward a little bit and the club face is up against the ball, that club is going to push against the ground and probably squeeze a bit of turf out after impact. What you're not trying to do is hit down to take a divot. You should be very level through the ball, but with forward shaft lean that will cause pressure. That's what you should be working on, I think. Tight draws. Name. Tight draws. Hi, Adam. My Hello. My question relates to the downswing and my tendency to hang back on the driver. Okay, tendency, the question is the downswing, and apparently you have a tendency to hang back, especially on the driver. That's not all bad, by the way. You will see if you look at a great golfer in motion on a, say, an eight iron, they will definitely look more tilted back as they hit their driver. Now, that doesn't mean you should have your weight on your back foot. You'll see them with their hips driven forward, but a little bit more of a spring back so they hit up on it. So make sure you're not too much trying to get to the front foot, in which case you might be chopping underneath the ball or breaking the tee. But generally speaking, when I see people a little unable to get through the shot, I think, and it's probably most common with the driver, too much thrust of the arms, and as they thrust down, they will pull you back. So let your arms react a little more and be a little more passive starting down. Uh, Ed Randall said, good evening from Texas. Hey, Ed Randall in Texas. Would the length of my club be plus one? What putter length should I have when six five? Wow. Should the length of your clubs be plus one? You're six feet five? Probably. Again, I would go to a club fitter because tall people, like every other person, come in shapes and sizes. I've seen some tall people with phenomenally We still rolling okay? And then your putter, should it be, standard is 35, which is kind of silly. It's really too long for most people. But you would be, again, depending on your, you know, physique a little bit, but you would almost certainly be 35 or maybe 36, probably 36, which is an extra inch. So, yes, I agree with you, based on not knowing your physique. Matt. Matt. Struggling with hitting wedges too high at times. 
you have a drill that works on hitting lower wedges, is it just less speed or maybe ball position further back in that stance? So Matt's struggling hitting his wedges high. Should he have less speed? Certainly when you swing slower, the ball doesn't go as high. Should he move the ball back? Probably not. And now I'm assuming you have normal ball position. The problem with moving it back is you start to create too much downward hit if you have decent motion. If you're a hangback scooper, it could help, but it's not a good long-term solution. The thing of it is, is... Yeah, so... If, if you're trying to hit it a little bit lower, I wouldn't move the ball back, and unless you're a three-quarter shot, I wouldn't slow the swing down. I think what you'd have to practice, impact is hard at full speed when you're not used to it. So practice it at about that sort of pace. It'll naturally go lower, but practice your impact. Two things, if you can drive enough to get your hands beyond the golf ball, it's not that difficult to do. If you can do it, just do it on a small scale. And when your hands are more forward at impact, it opens the face, so you have to tilt the loft towards the ball. So you would feel something where you feel the back of the hand curl under, and as, or that in conjunction with some flow and getting the handle past the ball. Don't be too stiff, get a little bit of flow, and the more you get past it, and the more you tilt the face, the better you'll do. If you work on that, by the way, your finishes should really be club head down, club head tilted forward, not up in the air by your head. Hope that helps. Brenda. Brenda. So my club's course is pretty wet and muddy. By taking a small bit of my club is stuck in the air. My ball goes nowhere. Any suggestions for hitting in those conditions? So Brenda's playing presumably in the winter a muddy, wet sort of golf course. Club's getting stuck sometimes. I mean, certainly, Brenda, it's not going to be a problem in an ideal world if you hit the ball before the turf. But I agree, you don't want to take a great big divot when it's muddy out there. So I would play the ball slightly farther back. A lot of times when it's muddy, it's cold, you're not moving quite as well, your feet are in a bit of a soupy, muddy condition, it's a little bit harder to move well. So play it a little bit farther back, not a lot, and kind of work on what we were just telling the other fellow there, work on getting the hands past the ball, but not in a stiff way, like if I'm going to you know, whip a carpet here in a nice dynamic way, Get the hands a little bit past the ball, tilt the face forward. What you cannot afford in muddy ground is either a steep angle of attack or scooping the ball. Those two are, uh, are surely going to cause you problems. Try to do that. Hopefully it would help a bit. You could possibly, if it's really soupy and muddy, choke up just a little bit. Might safeguard against a bit of a deep divot. Superman, what's the best way to square the club impact? Superman or at least that's your online name. Best way to square the club at impact. Uh, what you're really looking for is subconscious skill with that. So there's a lot of permutations, but I would check my grip number one. There is no exact right grip, but if it's in the fingers enough and at least wrapped over the club enough to hide the fingers, I don't see my fingertips looking down. The old adage is V to right shoulder. It should feel from there pretty easy to square the club up. So many people grip it in the palm, their hands a little on the front side of the club. That is very, very difficult to square the club up. So it should be reasonably easy based on your grip. The only other way to do it, honestly, assuming things are in the ducks are in relative row, you've got to fiddle around with variables. Hit a few low pinching hooks. Hit a few little carved fades. Go back to some neutral. That's how you build subconscious. That's how you learn to walk is fall here, fall there, and eventually don't fall, but you've got to feel both to get good at neutral. So grip and experiment. Benjamin asks, what's a good wrist hinge drill? Benjamin, what's a good wrist hinge drill? Here's my favorite drill. Glad you asked. Assuming a decent grip again. Remember the old Ben Hogan drawing in his book where he's balancing the club under that pad with just one finger on the club like that? That is a great little drill to make sure your grip is decent. Here's the one I recommend. Just hinge it in front of you, basically with a reasonable grip. Anybody can do that. That's how you want your hands to hinge, really. Certainly the right arm folds more than the left. The back of the wrist folds a little bit more than the left wrist, but you will be 95% of the way there if you do it that way and just turn to the top. Whatever that feels like to you, that's the feeling you should be getting. It's the most neutral, natural hinge. Todd in Northwest Florida just said thanks for the videos. He used several to help. Oh, Todd, in northwest Florida, Jacksonville, Virginia, no, that would be northeast. Try Pensacola, Tallahassee, okay, yeah, I'm glad you said the videos have helped you, I'm pleased to hear that. You know, with these videos you've made for Scratch Golf over the years and on the YouTube channel at Scratch Golf, 
Part of it, you look for things that are popular topics, slicing, hitting it solidly, but a big part of it, when you get to the topic, you know, in my case, I've taught golf for 35 years or so, and pretty much full time, is you've tried so many ideas out with people to try to solve certain problems, and I've had a lot of good input from some great people. You kind of distill down to some things that you feel like as the coach, hey, this works pretty well most of the time. And when they've got this problem, this seems to be a drill that works. So we've tried to bring those things to the videos so they're, in a way, they're vetted out with 25, 30 years of on-the-hands teaching. And that's why I think, I hope, they resonate with people and they find them reasonably easy to implement and reasonably helpful. Uh, Carl Daniels. Carl Daniels. I've been fighting with chipping yips. Please help. What can I do to Chipping yips. If I was to be honest with you, Carl, just between you and me, on occasion, I've had a little bit of that too. I have rarely met a golfer that's played for 20 years that hasn't had their moments with chipping. I think what you'd say, whether it's putting or chipping, they're a little bit different. What usually is the genesis of the yips, which are the twitches or whatever, is your sub a pretty delicate little shot now. You don't have a whole lot of speed and lower body movement, and your subconscious starts to sense this thing isn't going to match up. What I'm doing isn't going to hit the ball properly, and in order to help you, it tries to help you out a little bit like that. So usually, I don't know about usually, but more commonly than not, people get the club I find chipping too far, too rotated, too far behind them. That is going to hit the ground too early or hit it to the right. And then there's a little twitch to try to get the, the club head square. Sometimes they're too far behind it. So I would look for technique first. Can you get in a position relative to the ball and make a backswing? I mean, picture my hand versus my glove. That is pretty much just going to fall onto my glove. I would have to work hard not to. And once you feel like that's reasonably automatic, at least automatic as in function, then you can slowly just practice and work the yips out. But if you've got something that causes you to have to correct at the last second, it's hard to get rid of it. If you, if you get an absolute solution to that, by the way, you should write a book. You'll make a lot of money. Yeah. I have a slight wrist motion at the beginning of my back swing rather than keeping the club in line with my forearm. Is that incorrect? A slight wrist motion? Mr. McDonald there at the top of the end of the backswing? Beginning of the, oh, the beginning of the backswing. Okay, so you're talking probably in the takeaway. Now my guess would be, well, would it be this way so it looks more in line from there? It, from this view, honestly, it's not gonna look in line very long. You look at the best players in the world, the club has a lot farther to travel than the arms, and even though I'm not recommending a wristy takeaway, it is just isn't gonna look in line for very long. So by the time you're at your leg, it should be well past your left arm. I think the more critical look, and I, hopefully I'm addressing your question, is as you look from this angle, two checkpoints. Is this space staying about the same? And is the club head staying on that side of the hands at the beginning of the backswing? If you're doing those two things, I wouldn't worry about what you see from this view, if I've got your question correct. Uh, John the Third. John the Third. Club face open too much for John III, that's far the most common problem. I really would check the grip. I know it's boring. We talked a little earlier about let it rest in the fingers. Let your wrist be soft, a little bit cupped. You're wrapped over the top of the club. You've got John Rahm. I mean, if I had to play with John Rahm's grip, I'd shoot 98. I, that's the worst looking left hand, and he shoots 68. But his left hand for impact is, is almost deformed looking to get the club square, and he does it at a high rate of speed. Don't try that. That's, that's tough to do. So make sure the grip is in the fingers enough and wrapped over enough. You don't see your fingertips. It's just a lot easier that way. And then as we said earlier, so many people, they either do two things if they have a decent grip and leave the club face open. They either pull too hard, then there's no resistance for the club to snap against, or when they do snap it, they add angle to the left wrist, which just keeps the club face open. So if you can hold the club up in front of you and tilt it to the ground, you'll feel kind of bowed under with this wrist. A lot easier to do with the grip. That's what you're trying to do, but you're trying to do it. So as you come into impact, you hit the brakes a little bit with your body and crack the whip and close that thing. You have to have some resistance against which to do it. And as I said to someone earlier, Hey, just get a nine iron on a 70 yard scale and overdo it till you're snap hooking a few and you can see these knuckles under that forearm. That's that twist when you go through. Hit yourself some hooks, you'll be out of it in no time.
A B realms. A B realms. How to control pressure in golf tournaments. How to, oh, this is another good one. How to control pressure in golf tournaments. <laughs> it's another one. If you can figure this out, write a book. I think the first thing is experience. The more golf tournaments you play, the more familiar any setting is to you, the less wearisome it gets. And bear in mind, I don't know of any player in history, Jack Nicklaus included, according to his own testimony, that didn't feel a little bit of butterflies on the first tee. It's just normal. But play enough tournaments to get used to it. My brother was in, used to live in Kansas City, and he ran into Tom Watson in some store years and years ago. And at the time, my brother's son, my nephew, was 15. He was playing some tournaments, and he said, hey, Mr. Watson, could I ask you one question about my nephew? Do you have any general advice he's trying to get good? And he said, play as many tournaments as you can until you're used to it. So that would be one thing. The second thing is just being philosophical. I mean, my dad was in the Second World War, Royal Air Force, five plane crashes, shot at. Fortunately for me, I, there, there are really bad things happening in the world. Making a double bogey isn't fun, but it just isn't the end of the world. Once you get it in context, and you say, hey, listen, I want to hit a good shot. The world, my life isn't dependent on it. And once you've played a bit of tournaments, that helps. And I think the other thing is playing tricks with yourself sometimes. I'm kind of a kind of a cautious little kind of a mealy mouth, cowardly type of person when I get the gun under me. I know that. And so what used to happen to me in tournaments is I'd make a hash of the first few holes and I get so mad at myself, I'd really get at it. Unfortunately, I was already a few over par and I was on the fourth tee. So I tried to duplicate that and I'd say to myself, you knucklehead in my own mind, how could you start with three straight bogeys and just play a game? And what you'll find is your mind reacts, your body reacts to the emotions your mind gives it, whether or not those emotions are justified. If you're terrified and there's nothing to be terrified of, you will not you will have a good motor program. So three things, lots of tournaments, rationalize the importance of it and play a game with yourself if you can find a state of mind that makes you a little bit more productive. may not be the one I had. Good one there. Positive thoughts. Good imagery. Good imagery. Cobra, what's your jugger? So jugger. Jugger? I have a longer torso and arms. Longer torso and arms. Oh, so you've got a relatively, a Sandy Lyle was built like that, two-time major champion, relatively modest, probably legs my size, he's 6'2", big long torso and arms, strapping, I actually think that's a, a reasonably good, it's a pretty good physique, because yeah. some height gives you some leverage, but you don't have your center of gravity a mile off the ground, so I'm going to say, I don't necessarily think you need to get wider, probably. Uh, and, and I was given some of my oldest brother's a doctor, and years ago I got my blood pressure tested. It's 25, 30 years ago. It was on the low side, but we have a bit of a family history to that. So I, I called him. I said, hey, I got my blood oh, I forget what it was. I said, what should I do? And he said, enjoy it. And that was his terminology. So I think if you've got that physique, hey, if you want to be a hair wider, that's a good physique for golf. I would just enjoy it and thrive with it. I think it's a lot harder to have super long legs and a short upper body. I mean, David Ledbetter and Nick Faldo are both 6'3". I've got a picture of me years ago next to them, and they're both like there over me. But David Ledbetter's belt line comes up to there on Nick. Nick has a big upper body and reasonable legs. David's got huge, long, thin legs or, you know, slim legs. And uh, Nick's body is a little easier to play with. Uh, Cobra Junkie. Cobra Junkie. Is there a time on switching or upgrading so Cobra's a nine handicap. He's 75. You might get himself a Christmas present of new clubs. Is it a good time? Is there a time to do it? I mean, listen, one thing I would say, I taught a guy years ago. He was a lot of fun. He was there with his son, and they were doing all this stuff. And he said to his son, what good is a hobby if you can't throw some money at it? <laughs> right? They were having fun together, taking golf lessons, playing an expensive course. If you really like clubs, some people just love clubs. Dabble with it and enjoy it. Don't be undisciplined. Get someone that knows how to fit a little bit to get it in your hands, get the good stuff. But if you like that sort of stuff, do it. I'm not a big club change guy. I just kind of like what I'm used to, but treat yourself to that. But I really, really recommend get them in your hands, get a fitter there. I mean, hey, if you want to try the blades a bit, they're great looking. 
Uh, you might consider, depending on your nine handicap, maybe more blades in the short irons. They have some sets that sort of matriculate into more cavity back to almost hybrid on the long cut. It's a great combination of clubs. You get the great looking short irons, a lot easier to hit than the blade forearm. Fiddle around, get a club fitter, and at the end of the day, it's your hobby. Go have some fun with it. Tray, trail heel, let's assume right-handed golfers jumping up too much. Who's this question from, Kevin? Tight from tight drawers. Well, it doesn't sound like you're having too many problems there. And you're having a hard time shifting weight, right? I mean, I think, again, to me, without being able to see a swing, when I, a lot of times you could say one of two things may be at the genesis of it. Either the club's in a bad spot. A lot of times if it's steep, someone that's more athletic will jump a bit like this to get the club back in position. It helps, too. You just don't want to have to do it. And when they do that, they'll almost always stick this foot up in the air. And all this movement here makes it hard to move that way. So my guess is there's something that's agitating it. Sometimes you get someone that's in a good spot and is just so quick from the top of the bat downswing that they start losing their balance. But I would check your backswing. Is from this angle your left arm relatively across your shoulder plane and the club more back behind your shoulder starting down, not in front of you? You're going to find from there, if you jump too much, you're going to hit a foot behind it. So check that. If that's good, hey, take some of the arm speed out and make some little swings till you can start to find your balance a bit. Again, what you're trying to do in golf really is use your core, which is your glutes, your abs, anything that controls your hips. Your legs are really there. They move a little bit, but to give that a platform to work off. You're not trying to hit it with your legs. So feel like, hey, if I'm glued to the ground, can I engage this a little bit more? Than, than just using my legs so much. Uh, Pitt said, what up, Pitt. Can you show me the transition from takeaway to the backswing? I've lost weight, so I explain my struggle. Takeaway to oh, the backswing. Well, Pitt, that's Charles Barkley apparently swing a little bit better now. Did you guys see him? He got some lessons and he's. Who did he get lessons from? The short game guy. What's his name? Not Pels. You can never think of his name. Uh, I've got his. Contact information in my phone before we tried to get him to come out to Mediterra once. Stan Utley is a very good, cool guy, by the way. Very good short game teacher out in Arizona. So top of the backswing, I think a couple of things you'd try to do. You'd try to feel like you could map out a nice position. And as you get more used to that, away from the ball, without thinking too much, can you go from A to B in the most simple fashion? If there was a light right here I had to break out, and it wasn't golf, I just had to smash the light like that, I would probably get there in a pretty efficient way. Now, once people start to hit the golf ball, a lot of other things happen. So is it efficient enough? And just bear in mind from this angle, hey, certainly the body you know, wants to initiate and kind of lead, but the club still has a lot farther to travel than the body does there. So one of the things my old boss Ledbetter used to really look at is he'd watch the body more on TV, and assuming the club is in a decent position, did the body coil finish right about as the club finish positions? If you start going in different places or one thing's moving too much from the other thing, too much body, too much arms, it will never look very efficient and clean. So those two test litmus tests, I think, would be good. Uh, Ian Hickey. Ian Hickey. Okay, so Ian's been using the lag shot. That's helped. We worked on his posture a little bit. That's helped. You know, so often, I mean, honestly, just to digress for a second, what makes someone able to hit a golf ball? I mean, this sweet spot is the size of a nickel. You've got a club that's moving eight, nine feet. It's a wonder people can hit the good shots they do. So, you know, what makes someone able to do it really is time on task and talent. Some people have a little more time, on time to give. Other people have a great deal of talent or not that much. But if you can, you're only going to get probably so much time and you, God gives you so much talent. If you can develop simple sound habits, get used to them, work a little away from the course, I guarantee you that if for six months, every golfer in America north of a 10 handicap was given by divine decree Adam Scott swing, but same amount of practice and talent as they have, everyone would play better than they do today. The simpler the motion, the better. So I kind of digress there. What was the original question a little bit there? Oh, yeah. So you've worked on a couple of simple things. The lag shot's great for feel. It's not technical. You just feel stuff. It's heavy. You can kind of feel where the club is. I mean, it's a little heavy. 
And good posture is always a good thing. I mean, how many golf lessons that have been worth their salt have skipped posture if a person's got a posture problem? So you're building correctly, just keep at it, is what I would say. Lagshot's got a lot of products coming out. They've got wedges, junior clubs, ladies clubs, a junior incremented set for your kid to bring them along. You've got, what, a special oversized driver now or an XL driver, some really cool products because, you know, the problem when you sell a 7-iron is it doesn't fit everyone, although a 7-iron fits most people. But with all these other choices out there, if you go to lagshotgolf.com, there's some really good stuff there. And at Scratch Golf, we've got full courses in every aspect of the game from mental to sand to chipping to course strategy to putting to green reading to driving to swing to irons. Enjoy that stuff. Work through it at your own pace and have some fun with it. You get some ideas as to stuff to work on. Practice habits, off-season courses, they're all there for the members, so hope you'll consider. By the way, one other perk for monthly members is uh, one of our golf pros on staff, Chad, who I've known for 30 years. Uh, you get, I think it's about $24.99 for the monthly membership, right around that. So you get not only the entire library of courses, all the stuff on the app, but you get a monthly lesson from Chad. I'm not kidding. You get a monthly golf lesson. There's an app, there's part of the app where you can send your swing in. Chad jumps on there. He's really good at it. I've known him a long time. And he gives you some tips and some thoughts, sends you a nice little video. I mean, you can't beat that kind of feedback. If you're getting feedback like that and you've got all the video courses, I mean, hopefully you'd enjoy that. So hope you'll consider that. Brad Holt. What drill do you recommend to release the club? To release the club. Two things you would say are, are compose the release. Number one is the closing of the club face. Obviously, the club swing on somewhat of an arc that takes care of that, but it's the closing of the face. And the other thing is the snapping straight of the wrists, and if you like to continue the club passing the hand. So try to figure out which of those two, or maybe both, you're working on. But I think it comes down to two things. Can you let's assume grip and club face reasonably. Can you get the club coming at a pretty good angle to the ball, side of the body, close to the ground, not down on top of it? And when you get there, can you transfer energy from you out to the club like that? Most people, when they skip a rock, do that. They don't just lunge and let go of the ball and it doesn't reach the lake. They could crack a fly swatter. But honestly, most people, when they hit a golf ball, the, what they feel is them, not the club, and they try to hit it hard, and they speed up through the ball, and because they're so aggressive, the club doesn't have anything against which to pop. If you're using the fly swatter, you don't run your arm into the wall. You stop and do that. So decent position, a grip can help you square it. Can you transfer energy? Like always, if you're working on impact, do a small scale. Um, Pam. 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 Boy, those are two good ones there, Pam. Consistency and distance. I like to be slightly taller, a little bit younger. I'll, I'll tell you if you'll tell me. Consistency and distance. I mean, there's a, <laughs> you got my answer. They're somewhat related. I'm telling you, there's, it's an interesting statistic that is borne out with a huge amount of launch monitor data, and that is the farther someone hits the ball, the more they can carry it. Some of that's related to age and physique, but the farther they hit it, the straighter they hit it. Now, that means the less variance from zero at takeoff. If you're hitting a drive 280, it probably gets offline a little easier than if you're hitting it 180. So it may not at the end of the ball flight, but they get it straighter. That is to say, what, gives, what makes them hit it straighter is it takes a lot of skill and good movement to create that kind of speed. And with that, invariably comes reasonable directional control as a rule. And I think, you know, when you look at consistency and distance, I wouldn't separate them. I wouldn't try to get consistent and then try to add distance. I'd try to get a swing that was powerful. You could hit it as far as you reasonably could. And I think in the journey to do that, you'll find positions that will give you reasonable consistency. Golf is not a game that lends itself to consistency, by the way, but you can get it manageable. Cole Cadman. Cole Cadman. Charleston, Australia. Charleston, Australia. Wow. Nice to see you, Cole. Okay, so Cole's retired, lives in Australia. Appreciate you saying you're enjoying the videos. Question is how to move the lead leg and the lead foot. I would think of it more this way. I would really think more of your core than your leg, but here's what you'd probably feel in your leg if you're doing it right. I feel pressure in the ground starting down, probably a little more towards the ball of the foot than the heel. 
that is kind of the initiator. And once you've established the pressure, which will involve a little bit of weight shift. I mean, if I had to squash a bug under my foot, I'm not going to hang back here and do it. Once you've pushed down and the club's in the hitting area, that's the time to start to push up. Not with your head, but off the ground, squeeze your glutes and push your hamstrings up. You watch the great players in slow motion, pressure followed by pushing up and around. And as you create that ground force, your hips will turn a lot easier. And really your leg, it shouldn't be doing that much. It should just be helping more with the ground force and the pressure. So those are some maybe mental pictures, if you like. Jazzy J. The gray goat. The gray something. Um, the white goat these days, but that's kind of you. Too kind. Yes, yes, it will. And it'll be, of course, at scratchgolfacademy.com, where for members, uh, the old, uh, the old uh, call in shows are all stored. You might enjoy those. So, yeah, that's the plan. That's the plan. I thank you for the kind comment. Um, Anna, if you're working on a simulator over the winter, what are the metrics you should be paying the most attention to? The overwhelming amount of data. Yeah. I mean, I think the things you have the most control over are swing speed to some extent, angle of attack, that's how much down or up you're hitting, uh, swing path, and of course to some extent club face. Now, ball spin, smash factor, apex height and all those things, they're not always totally reliable when you're hitting into a net to be honest with you. Uh, they're pretty good at predicting that, but I think I'd go for the things you can control. And I would say if you're I'd mix it. If your swing path is pretty good within a couple of degrees of the target line, if you're starting to hit the ball solidly, go for speed. But when you go for speed, don't do it ad infinitum. Do it for a couple, three minutes, then dial back again and see how your numbers are. And if when you're going for speed, you really break down in contact and swing path and angle of attack, take the speed out. But your goal is to build some speed with those things. That's one of the best feedbacks they give, along with, I think, swing path and you know angle of attack. RN. What do you think? A fade better or a draw? A fade or a draw better. Lee Trevino used to say, a fade, what did he say? I don't know. A hook fades great, but a hook won't listen or something. Usually that's because a hook involves more face rotation, the ball speed's a little higher, and once that thing turns, it's running a lot more than the fade. Now, that said, Lee Trevino is not your average golfer. I think. Here's a little something someone told me about 30 years ago that's very good in the world of golf, and I never forgot it. He said, you know, I've looked at golfers. He said, higher handicappers, mid to higher, almost all get a little bit out here and fade the ball. They might pull a few balls. And he said, the problem with that is you just don't hit it very far. Unless you're David Duval with quick hips in his prime, you're not going to hit it that far fading it. And so they curve the ball. They don't reach holes. He said, if they could go through a period of, three, four years where they get the club maybe too far from the inside, sling the face more, get it turning over, hey, they're not going to have tour level control, but they start to pick up distance and start to reach holes in regulation, get it up near some par fives in two, etc. Once they've had a few years of that and they've got some distance, then they can kind of go from a little too much hook back to more neutral, and then they usually really dial it into you know mid-70s, reliable golf, maybe par golf. So I would think of it for most people, try to learn to draw the ball more than fade it. No offense to Lee Trevino, I doubt he's watching the show though, so I should be safe with that. Lovely Trevino, six time major champion. Anthony. Oh really? Well it's probably Anthony's great friend, in fact that indoor that off-season course I was mentioning earlier, that's the guy that's on it. So Anthony calls in. I think what you'd probably be saying, the reason that would be Anthony, is because if you're really going to draw it, there's a certain amount of resistance and rip and thrash of the club. And I think when you slow down and the club speeds up, yeah, boy, that's harder on the back. At least if you're fading it, you're moving more with it. But uh, you know, it's, I, David Ledbetter came down as a guest to a one-day golf school where I worked here in Naples was great to be his assistant again for the day. We sold it out to some members and had some fun. I'll tell you a funny story about that in a moment if you're interested. I guess you can't decide whether you're interested or not. But he said something interesting to me. David's an original thinker. He's a very creative guy, even though he comes across in his books as kind of fastidious and technical. And he said, 
he'd come out with that Ace Wing book, and he said, uh, with emphasis, he said to me, he said, you know, I have come to hate shut club faces. And I thought, wow, that, that doesn't sound right to me. I mean, most people actually, if it's a little shut, probably have a better chance to get it squared impact. And I said, why is that? And he said, because if you look at great players, he said, with Lee Trevino as an exception, I will add, they never really had great longevity. And he said, the reason is, if you've got the face shut, if you don't have tremendous hip speed and body rotation, you'll hit too many hooks. And he said, as players get to be 45, 50, 55, and they play a lot, that's hard on the body. He says, I like to see someone able to get the face a little more toe down, certainly use their hips, but allow the club to release a little bit. He's not advocating a hook. So it was kind of an interesting comment that he made there. He got this, I'll tell you the story very quickly. He got Jim Cook, who's a great friend of mine at the club, got a brand new Mediterra glove. David calls him up, he's got his Sharpie, and he marks up all the stuff that's doing wrong. He says, now here, open, and he puts it all on, and this glove is a roadmap within three seconds. So Jim sits down, and he's kind of looking at his glove. It's just marked everywhere, and he doesn't care. And he says to David, Wow, David said, well, you know, and he says, would you mind autographing it, David? So David says, sure, he's laughing like that. So he sits down. A minute later, Jim read it. It said Butch Harmon on there. <laughs> he didn't want his name on that glove. So <laughs> David and Butch are friends, by the way. It's pretty funny. Jim has the glove in a frame in his, uh, in his man cave these days. Anyway. Sean. Hitting down on your driver, yeah, that's it will really cost you distance, I'll tell you. Uh, almost, I would say 10 to 1 to make a number up, people get too out over the top, which hits much more down than from here, versus people that hit down on it by having so much lag and weight shift. That's much, much less common. So, common. so hey, check your ball position. Am I behind the ball enough? Is the ball here a little bit of tilt? I think what you're going to want to feel is some swings where, hey, you can have a little bump of weight, but you stay back and really feel like the club releases. The old Jack Nicklaus, right after impact, was the longest distance, he used to say, between the club head and his right shoulder. If that's working two together and you're getting steep on it, it's not going to work. I'm telling you, most people without a golf ball, if you said, hey, can you throw the club up in the air out there, they wouldn't just consistently throw it into the ground. They'd just hang back and release it and throw it up in the air. So that mental picture, could I throw the club up, is a good one too. More release, less body, less torso. Greg? Greg? Greg. Rag. Rag. Yeah, so Rag's talking about the right hip release, right-handed golfer, no doubt, versus early extension. I mean, I think it's, you know, we talked about early extension earlier in this little show. It has somewhat to do with the angle you're coming to the ball at. If you're coming down too steeply, you almost have to early extend unless you pull your arms in or something. But if you have a decent swing, what you're looking for is can you keep roughly the same amount of forward bend as you hit the ball, but keep moving and keep in balance? So often people work on staying over the ball, they get frozen. If you can keep in balance, once you're down in the area of the golf ball, I mean, hey, you want, as we said to someone, you want a little bit of spring and a little bit of rotation. You don't want to just stay down over the ball, but you've got to get in there with a good angle before you feel that. I've got a YouTube, I've got some at the full swing course at Scratch Golf. I've got a YouTube video. It's one of our more watched videos. It's about 10 minutes long on early extension. I did a subsequent one, but that first one a few years ago, I really think it, it's been popular, and I just think it, I would go to that. Go YouTube, Scratch Golf early extension, Get that one that's about nine, 10 minutes long. It really gives you some drills and some thoughts for that. I don't know if that's a good answer or not. Um, Brady, Holmes is a lefty golf. Brady Holmes is a lefty. Gary's a lefty, founder of Lagshot. What can I work on to keep my right arm straight? So you, your lead arm straight. So I'll do it as a right hand, as my lead arm. I really believe that if someone grips it well, picture it this way. If I watch the end of the club, if I hinge it, the end of the club is getting slightly farther away from me. That isn't a hinge, that is. So I think it's a lot tied into two things. One is this, and that is once you've gotten past this leg, as you hinge, the handle should be getting slightly farther from you. If there was a laser light, it would point out there. And that actually lengthens your lead arm a little bit. If someone gets up here, they've got the grip in the palm, it's not hinging. I've yet to meet the person very often that's gonna hit it from there. They will almost invariably fold their arms trying to get that to happen. One other thing though, lat flexibility. Do the little test. So there's a wall here.
bend your knees and get the back flat against the wall, not arched. Put your arms out like that, and if you can touch the wall with your thumbs without spreading your arms or arching your back, you are flexible enough to make a decent backswing and keep that left arm straight. If you're arching and spreading your arms, you're just not flexible enough. You need the Tom Watson look where there's space, but there's a little bit of softness. What else? Ian is in Scotland. Ian's in Scotland. That's a good Scottish name. Hey, Ian. Easy and reliable drill for weight trials. We're talking downswing, no doubt. I did a thing, I don't know, some video somewhere, if you ever watched it, recently, though, and I was saying that I've done a lot of, seen force plates a lot. In the backswing, you really rarely see a golfer that's elite move their hips. There's been a couple. They just pivot. Now, the act of having your arms swing, there's weight in your arms, creates or helps create some pressure in the ground, but you're not trying to so to speak, shift your weight. So elite players are really anywhere from about 80-20 to roughly 50-50 on it. I've seen some great force play data of some tour players that are close to 50-50. Where you see it more consistent is through impact. And certainly on a short iron, it's anywhere from 80 to 90% on the lead side. So I think one of some, a couple of things, and these are regurges of stuff I said earlier. Number one, the biggest enemy I see is people bring the club and the arms down too quickly. If that just sits there, you ask yourself, how many people do you have ever met couldn't shift their weight without a golf club in their hands? Zero, I would say. And then the other thing is, so if your arms are passive, think more in terms of pressure into the ground, not shifting your weight so much. And I think that's probably how I'd go about it. Dave, two or three of the most important muscle groups. We should get Anthony back on the phone for that, right? Which did you say? Yeah, legs, really important. Glutes, legs, back muscles, abs. If you can control your core muscles and your legs, you've got a pretty good shot at it. I mean, there are certainly some exercises for the wrists and things like that, but... Give me the person with a good, strong core any time. I'll tell you something else, just to slightly digress. One of the things that's a great exercise for people is segment separation. Four segments in golf, hips, upper trunk, thoracic, arms, and club. And they should work like a whip. And a couple of things you want to know, the more you can separate the segments, some of these tour players are here with their hips and their upper body still here. It's like me moving my hand and the end of the whip not moving, the more energy you'll create. And secondly, the faster you can move the segment, then the faster you can decelerate it, the more energy. So if I've got a towel, that creates a lot more speed than a long, slow movement. So doing exercises such as working your hips independently of your shoulders, working your shoulders independently of your hips, put your hands in a door frame, get your hips going. A lot of it isn't just flexibility. A lot of it is neuromuscular coordination. People have sat at desks for... 40 years, so now they can finally afford to play golf. They're just, they haven't worked that stuff. One of the things I think was an accidental blessing for me, I grew up over in Britain and I played a lot of soccer when I was young along with golf. And in soccer, you've been watching it, you know, in the World Cup probably. In soccer, you're constantly moving in different directions and changing the ball like that and moving around. You get used to athletic movements like that. And if you can move like that, I'd work on that kind of movement pattern along with strength sort of stuff. Ian from Scotland, more height on the mid to long irons. Well, there's probably a couple of things you could say. Number one, all things being equal, the harder the ball is hit, the more ball speed created, the more height you'll get at your apex. So, you know, it could be that if you're just not hitting it very far, maybe your five iron goes 140 or something like that, it's hard to get it very high in the air. But, you know, you can work on ball speed and club speed. Of course, I don't know your game. The second thing is, Angle of attack. We don't want to scoop the ball, but you want to be very level through the shot if you're going to... Let me digress one more time. It is one of golf's great misnomers is that the more you hit down, the more the ball goes up. People say that all the time. That is absolutely not true. I'm telling you, I've got a magnetic pointer on that we stick on people's clubs, and I say, if you swung this way, do you think the magnet would fly off higher than if you swung that way? Well, absolutely not. Fact is, you've got to hit ever so slightly down to make solid contact, but you don't want to hit excessively down, especially with a long iron. So I would practice a low tee, 
picking it off the tee, not scooping it, but picking it, and then just work on your club head speed, work on your energy, see if you can get the ball up in the air. Yeah. Yeah. The off-season master course, which is a five, five sets of videos, three of which are with this fantastic golf fitness expert that works as the lead players that was just calling in because he's a friend of ours. Uh, they're all available to elite members, to premium, to premium members. So off-season master series is what that whole thing's called. One of them is me showing you ways to practice indoors, and one of them is a club fitting expert giving you some thoughts about customizing your set in the off season. But the off season master series is for all. That's yet another course. I'm not trying to sell you on it, but I'm telling you there's a lot of content there would fill your winter out that's available to premium members. Superman. Again. Superman. Superman. Best advice to stop topping the ball. Best advice to stop topping the ball. Yeah. <laughs> Asking for a friend. I love it. That's good. <laughs> And so I'm not buying this for me, I'm buying it for a friend, that sort of thing. By the way, I get out and about a little bit in the summer, plan to again this, this year, Lord willing. one of the guys that's on this show was texting me earlier because he was having a hard time signing in. Gave him, a, gave him a little mini golf school in Myrtle Beach. So if you ever go to Adam B Golf, A-D-A-M-B Golf, and just leave your information there, I'll get you that summer information, maybe see you out on the road in the summer. Okay, so the question is topping the shots. Usually it's one of two things, either hanging back so the bottom out point is too early. And most golfers are not consistently just going to hit the ground behind the ball. Most of the time they'll hedge and miss the ground, but the trouble is they're on their upswing when they get to the ball. And I would say the other one that's just as common, club comes down too sharply, too steeply, it's going to crash into the ground. So what a person does out of survival, they either raise up or they raise their arm, they bail a bit on the shot and they top a lot of shots. So if you're going to avoid the top, you've got to do two things. Number one, you need a nice long level spot where the club is, at least for that long, pretty low to the ground. You won't top too many balls if you have that. And with that, you just need enough flow and weight transfer to make sure that most of that level spot's in front of the ball. Practice it on a small scale again. If you film yourself, and you see your arms look a bit like this, or you look a lot taller, you're probably too steep, and that's probably the reason. Uh, Kevin. Kevin. Uh, fairway, fairway, fairway Woods. Actually, what I was just talking about, I think is great for Fairway Woods. The people that, uh, tiny anecdote, Jack Nicholas, about 20 years ago, you know how the Golf Digest does US Open Edition, Masters Edition, Ryder Cup Edition? Had a Ryder Cup edition. So they said to Jack Nicholas, you rate driving, fairway woods, long irons, middle irons, short irons, pitching, sand, and putting, the best American golfer, in other words, kind of a Ryder Cup player through the bag, an honorable mention. And in fairway woods, he mentioned he gave Hale Irwin the nod. Pretty interesting there. So uh, I don't know what good that does you, three-time US Open champion. But I think it really comes down to the people that have the best fairway wood game have very level sweeping movements through the ball. They don't get steep and they bail. So practice, just take your five wood at home and make some nice long level low spots with a little gentle arc to it, then add some speed. If you can consistently brush that ground, you should be a good fairway wood player. That's what I would say. Jack, Jack Nicholas rated Ben Hogan as the best driver he saw. Sam Snead is the best long iron player. He had Byron Nelson is the best middle iron player. Johnny Miller is the best short iron player. Ray Floyd is the best bunker player. Tom Watson is the best chipper pitcher. And Tiger Woods is the best putter. There you have it, folks. As the best putter. This was 20, 25 years ago now. This is a good 20, well, 18, 17 years. This was, I don't know. Now, Tiger would be, he probably would. He, he was statistically, since they kept kept the uh, stats the way they do with uh, what do you call it, shot link. Tiger was the best iron player in history, proximity to the hole. Pretty good. Best. Jack said he could be the best at just about everything, but I'm going to pick putting based on can you make a putt when you have to have it. So hard to, hard not to pick Tiger on that. Alex Jones from England. Alex Jones from England. Hello, Alex. Oh, thanks, Alex. Enjoying the videos. Playing for a year. 
Well, I appreciate that. Hey, stick with it, buddy. Get you, You're going to have some cool weather where you're at. We've talked about that. Get good at your motion here. Have some fun indoors. Hit some wiffle balls or whatever, but get used to what you want to do. You can film yourself on your phone inside and get some great feedback and just keep going through those courses, through those video courses so that your thinking is good. So that when you go out and play and experiment with stuff, you kind of have some good parameters in your mind. You got one or two more? Yeah, the Scratch Golf Academy app, I mentioned a little while ago to those, many of you might be on it right now, but there's an area there where you can film your own swing, and if you're a monthly member, a monthly premium member, you get to send that in as part of your $24.99 and get a golf lesson a month. We've got a staff member called Chad who's a terrific golfer I've known for 20 years, and not only can you send it to Chad and log your lessons so you can look at them, but you can film yourself, and it's a great app to film yourself with. It's better than just using the camera on your phone, although it does. Yes, if you want to get your swing critique by me. Now, the critiques I do are quite a lot more in depth. Chad's does a lot of them, so his are, you know, two, three minutes. So he gets you the meat and potatoes of what you want. But when you send one to me, what you'll get back is about an eight-minute video where you're going to see your swing in slow motion with graphics analyzed with obviously my voice on it. Frequently with a pro side-by-side -side split screen, highlighting differences, you'll see both angles. And then I'll get up in front of the camera, which will be on the video, and I'll demonstrate with voiceover the drills I think you should do. It's a very thorough thing, as thorough as I can make it. And I think you'd really leave there with a cause and effect feel, drills to combat it. So I hope you could take, take me up on that. We've got the, uh, what would it be? Yeah, if you go to the uh, the tools, the little crossed golf clubs at the bottom of the screen, I think second from right, that's all our tools. We've got swing tempo trainer, a lot of research done on how the pros go about tempo, some a video for me as to how to use it. Putting tempo trainer, I use that all the time in teaching. I go to the putting trainer app and use the different metronome settings based on tour averages. There's also a video there to tell you how to maybe pick the best one. Green reading trainer with a whole video on how to read. It's all in the tool section with the crosshair clubs at the app. So uh, there's lots of stuff there. Have some fun with it. What is it, 240? 246 videos in 26 defined courses. The reason these courses, see, people go on YouTube, and YouTube's fine, we've had a lot of views, but it's so catch as catch can. Your eye catches that, then you try this, then you go there. And for most people, they don't know enough to be discerning enough that they don't just get rolled over with too much information and what seems like conflicting information. So when you go through these courses, it takes you in, I try to keep my teaching simple, I hope you know that from the videos, but it takes you A to Z through the bunker shot, the variables, so you can work at your own pace and the information builds. So I hope you'd enjoy these courses. Uh, the app's so convenient, make it part of your training. The tools are great. If you want to join by the month, get Chad to look at your swing. He's really good at it. You, this is, it's, it's good stuff. I hope you'll take advantage of it. Really? Guys, gals, appreciate it. You've been very supportive of Scratch Golf. We're here with uh, you know, our good friends and teammates here. So uh, we appreciate you. Hope this is helpful to you. We're going to keep working on this and do it again pretty soon. We're just trying to sort out a couple of technical problems. There, I promise you, some of these are not on our end. A lot of preparation went into this tonight, so the little glitches was just something that we just couldn't foresee. But we plan to be back, and we appreciate you. How many roughly did we have? More than 25 or 30?